Well, good good morning. Today is the day of Pentecost. If you can't read that font, that's what that says there. It's a fancy font, kind of the oldest one I could find. Um, And so uh, the day of Pentecost is something that is monumental for the church. Uh, In fact, how many of you, I'm going to give you time of confession this morning, okay? How many of you did not know today was Pentecost Sunday? Awesome. So there's quite a few. How many of you did? I I need to probably, all right. All right. So just because you asked me. (laughs) I asked you to read the scripture for it. So one of the things about um, being in a church that is of our tradition, if you will, which is more um, reformed and and not necessarily in with mainline Christianity. Um, We're mainline Christians, but it's not within like the Catholic Church or the uh, Episcopalian mainline uh, Orthodox Church, is that we oftentimes forget that there's like a whole calendar uh, that is, is set for people around the world. So around the world today, all kinds of Christians and all kinds of denominations are celebrating Pentecost. Uh, that the Pentecost is a word that means 50. It's 50 days after the resurrection. It's also 50 days after Passover where there's a, a Jewish feast um, uh, called the Feast of, we- oh gosh, I forgot the name of it. But it's a Jewish feast there that's also there as well. But we as Christians celebrate 50 days after Easter. And it signifies when the Holy Spirit came down and filled the church. Now, we know the church that is, is people, right? It's not a building. The Holy Spirit filled the people to do the work of the Lord. And so Pentecost Sunday puts the Holy Spirit at center stage. And for well, a few months, we were focusing through the book of Acts on the Holy Spirit. So we've heard this scripture before recently within the last few months. But today we're going to, to look at it again. But I'm going to spend most of my time in Romans chapter 8 if you want to go there. But You just heard a few minutes ago the scripture read by Jim of Acts chapter 2, and the the Holy Spirit takes center stage and just fills the church, this rushing mighty wind. It It was the sound of the wind, but it didn't have the chaotic... Um physical effects that a a wind that strong would have. Like it wasn't blowing stuff around. It was just this sound and it was the Holy Spirit manifesting in a way that was going to change the way people lived forever. I mean, it it turned their hearts uh, to passionate followers of Christ. And in the same way, Paul in chapter 8 is writing in about the Holy Spirit of God. And he also talks about this spirit as this powerful, animated voice. It's, it's, It's hard to explain how God is moving. But it's powerful, and you, can, you don't really sometimes know how to explain it, but when you see it and when you experience it, you recognize it. And in this celebration of the Holy Spirit, he describes, uh, actually this described, we heard that reading too, uh, in the Gospel of John, this Holy Spirit is described as an advocate, all right? Someone who's there to, to stand in the gap for us. And Paul writes of the Spirit of God, look here with me in Romans chapter 8, verses 14. Through 17. We're just going to look at these four verses. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about, by your, brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, if we are His children, then we are His heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. This is the word of the Lord. So backing up to verse 16, you see this word, uh, this, the Spirit himself testifies. Uh, so Paul is saying that the Spirit of God testifies and bears witness with our spirit the things of God. And so there's, there's a Greek word there uh, for testifies, and it, it compounds some different words together, okay? And it means, it means with in, in one regard, it means it's, it's with, and also it means to witness, So there's this translation, possibly, that he bears witness with. 
So it's, it's the Spirit of God working with us to do something. So Paul could have simply written that the Holy Spirit witnesses our spirit, um, but he didn't do that. The emphasis is on a relationship between God and God's people. There's, there's a depth here that there's not something like a boss and an employee, but this relationship that God has with His people that the Spirit is intimately involved with our spirit. He's in tune with us. Sometimes we wish, I just wish, you know, my spouse or my friend or my coworker could just get into my head for a few minutes and understand me. I wish I, they, they just don't seem to get me. I wish they just knew how I felt this moment. Well, we have that intimacy with the Spirit of God. This, this entunement that God has with us. And so, what does the Spirit of God bear witness with our spirit? So what is He testifying and bearing witness with? Well, there's four things uh, that He does bear witness with. And so here's number one. He bears witness that we're children of God, if you want to write that down. This is what the Spirit of God tells you. That we are children of God. And as children of God, we are free. Amen? Amen. As children of God, we're forgiven. Amen? Amen. Man, I wish I could share some stuff with you, but just, oh, I can't do it. I, I'm trying to figure out a slick way to do it. I'm, I'm trying to do a reference to Stranger Things without doing a reference to Stranger I'm not going to do it. I'm moving past it. I'm moving past it. You guys need to watch it, though, and we can talk about it. There's some good stuff. All right. So, um, but just imagine your need to have someone to intercede for you, and that's exactly what Christ did for you. There's an accuser of the brethren, right, Satan, that tries to come in and just tear you down, and try to tell you how much you failed and keep you focused on that. That's not what the Holy Spirit of God does. The Holy Spirit tells you something different and says, because of your faith in me, because you follow me, you're my child. You're a child of God. It doesn't matter what the past is. You're a child of God. And this is what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And, and to kind of show you where we get that from in Romans chapter 8, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God led by the children. God reminds us who we are when we're fearful. Fear is a very motivating factor. It, it sells a lot. In fact, you, you should just be aware that every news outlet out there, it, every headline is trying to initiate. Fear sells. It, it causes clicks. And it, 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 it wants you to be divided so that you can take care of yourself. It, it motivates you to act. But God doesn't do that. God bears witness to us who we are when we are fearful. When we're suffering, when we think we're not enough, God says, you're my child. I'm here with you. When you think you're not enough, no, no, no. You are more than enough. You're my child. We are his beloved children. There's nothing you can do to change that. Once you are his child. Amen. We are God's children. The second thing that we are is that we are, oh, actually, I'm, I'll read the next few verses here. We are as children. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so you're not, right, you're freed and forgiven, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption and son, to sonship. Sonship here, you may be a, a woman here and thinking, well, I'm not a son. I don't have sonship. Yes, you do, because this sonship means that you're an heir. It's not like a gender thing. It's a, who the heirs were. And back then, the only one who could get heirs were men, right? The women didn't get uh, an inheritance the same way. And so what he's talking about here is this sonship, because Paul has other talks about there isn't a male nor female, right? There's all these kinds of things, and that doesn't mean there's not gender, all right? He's just saying that this, this, this sonship is this, you belong. You're his inherit, you're, you're his heir, which is going to be number two, by the way. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So as God is not just the God worthy of worship, but he is our Father, that we call on Him as our Dad. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So number one, the Spirit testifies we're God's children. Number two, spoiler alert, we are heirs of God. We are heirs of God. To be uh, heirs is not only to be brought into a right relationship with God, but also to be a co-heir, a joint heir with Christ. And to be an heir of God means that you are in a relationship with God the Father, but also with Jesus. And so Jesus is the true, ultimate first heir of God, the first within a large extended family. So he's the pioneer, and we are 
the ones who follow along. Being adopted into God's family means Jesus is our sibling. Isn't that interesting? He's, he's Lord and he's creator, but he's also our sibling, our brother. And that we too can cry out to God the Father as a child cries out to a parent, Mom! Dad! We can cry out to God. So believing in God is not, we're not saying that, okay, you could just make a statement of faith and now you're a follower of Christ. The belief in Jesus as Lord is an act of obedience. It, it, there's an active measure of doing something. There's obedience that's there. And when we respond to the call to live a, uh, a life that is shaped by the cross of Jesus, it means that we start to shape ourselves in a continuous movement from life to death to new life. So we, we die to ourselves, and we rise in love, and we rise in service to our neighbors, just as they did in the early church in Jerusalem described in Acts. They broke bread together. They cared for each other. They cared for the needs of the saints. They shared in all those things. So you see that. And so we, we see the, the heirs of God that here that if we are children of God, then we are also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. All right? So child of God, heirs of God. Number two, this is the best one. All right? You're going to love it. Number three, we suffer with Christ. Right? We love this one, don't we? Hey, it's real. We do. And suffering hurts a lot. There is a, a depth of knowing Christ that can only come through suffering. I was speaking with uh, my coach this week and just sharing some things with him, and he, he talked about this principle that you can't really learn something truly until you experience and go through it. Like You can know the principle of it, but you really learn it and know it when you go through it. And part of our lives is just, we, if we really just accept the fact that we're going to suffer, I'm not saying that we're going to have a terrible life and poor, pitiful me. I just mean life's going to be difficult, all right? There's going to be difficulties. We're going to go through things we don't understand, but there's a reason for it. God's working things somehow for good, even if it doesn't make sense to us at all. But when we suffer with Christ, He's there with us, so this, this suffering that we have here, God is with us, and when we suffer as one, we suffer as all. Um, th uh, we get that here from uh, Romans eight seventeen. It says, if indeed we share in whose sufferings? This is Christ's sufferings. We are heirs with Christ, indeed, if we share in his sufferings. So there will be sharing of sufferings that you're going to go through. It's there. It's going to happen. But the good news is there's a reason for it, usually a lot of reasons for it. And it's not just reasons to do with you. It's with the other people around you as well. Um, interestingly, the book of Exodus, we're going to take just a little bit of time here to step away into a different story. When Israel was suffering in Egypt, they were slaves for hundreds of years. And God was ready to do a new work. And he said, Moses, I'll just read it to you here. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord, why have you brought terrible, excuse me, trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Boy, anybody ever been there? You're like, God, all I'm doing is trying to do your work, and all this crazy stuff's happening. Anybody? Just me? Some of you? All right, there we go. Like, I'm just trying to do what you want me to do, and this is not working out. What are you doing? Are you not paying attention? All right, Moses, go for it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see. I love how God's not threatened. Every time I see this kind of stuff, God's not threatened and getting angry. He's not getting hot because, Who are you to come and question me? I feel that way sometimes. The Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, 
to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name the Lord, but by my main name the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them and gave them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. You see this is tied in to Romans 8, right? This is just flying off the street. I mean, they're, they're so connected. Drawing them out of slavery, drawing us out of slavery, into freedom, into freedom. You will be my people, I will be your God. This is all for us. I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? The same truths are for us. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Isn't that a powerful message? Don't you know that when the Israelites heard this from Moses, they were encouraged? Wouldn't that be encouraging to you? Well, guess what? They didn't receive the message that well. Sometimes God gives us a great message, and we don't hear it. Listen, listen this next verse, very next verse, verse 9. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to Moses because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Sometimes God can't be more clear to us than He is. But sometimes we can't listen, or we're not listening because we're discouraged. And there's harsh laborers, like this, this oppressive labor that was over them. They had gotten to a place where they couldn't fathom that God could do anything for them. So I want to encourage you today. The story goes on, and you know how it ends. Israel does get delivered. God shows His mighty hand, and they are miraculously delivered from slavery. But I want to encourage you. Is there an area or are there areas in your life where you're so discouraged or you're so oppressed and burdened that God is speaking to you, but you just can't hear it? So if you are, talk to someone about that and say, hey, this right here is really discouraging me. I'd be glad to talk with you about it if you want to, but sometimes it's best just to talk to a friend or a close um, relative or somebody, somebody that you want to talk to. But where you're discouraged is where the enemy is going to try to attack. And he's going to try to remind you of how hopeless it is. He's going to remind you of how much you've screwed up. And if you stay there, you're going to stay down. But if you'll turn, you'll look, and you'll listen to the Lord, then he'll bring you out, right? He'll bring you right out. Suffering with Christ has purpose, and it leads to the... This should be number four. It says number three, but just make that a four in your own notes. The fourth thing here is that the Spirit testifies that we are, to be glor we are going to be glorified with Christ. So there is suffering, yes, but listen, there's a glorification that's coming. It's happening, it's, hap it's happened, it's happening, and it's coming, right? We don't see it in full yet, but we see it in part, that this glorification that's coming. And so in Acts chapter 8, 14, it says, in order that we may also share in God's glory. It means to glorify with. When we suffer, Christ is present with us in that suffering. Do you, do you like know that? Or do you feel like you're alone? That's where the enemy's trying to get you. He's trying to isolate you, because if you're alone by yourself, you're easy prey. But as a Christian, guess what? You're never alone. God is there with you. The Spirit is there with you. These, these short little verses have this intimacy that there's this witness with God, this powerful relationship where there's God and there's the, the parent, child, and spirit. We're, we're called into a relationship each of you are called into a relationship with God, and He's your parent to whom you cry to. And your daddy can beat up anybody else's daddy. <laughs> Amen? This 
The Spirit testifies that we are children of God. The, the day of Pentecost reminds us that we are children of God, that He's chosen to, to dwell and live within us in a way that was never known before. Even the, the way the Spirit filled the Old Testament prophets wasn't the same way. There was this manifestation that is special for God's children in this age of the church. There are... <clears throat> there's a mission we have, and it's a lifelong mission to get back to the, what do we do with all this? And it's dying to the old self. It's dying to the, the old self. And, and Paul talks about that. He, he uses phrases like flesh. You know that word, flesh? And it doesn't necessarily mean just the physical body, but he's talking about like the fleshly desires, the worldly desires that go against God. And so it, it can be easy to understand that, that we need to, well, maybe it's not easy to understand, but we can die into the body, into the flesh. We're to be raised in a newness of life, a, a new life. And Paul is talking about um, the categories that are with law, sin, and death. And so what Paul is talking about is, and I sum it up this way, it's a huge category, but all the things that separate us from God, sin, all the things that can separate us from God, those powers are at work in this world, and they can be in our own minds, what we're thinking about. They can be in our own bodies, in our own spirit. They can be outside of ourselves. They can be in other structures, other people. But the physical body is a place that where we can encounter God and have His Spirit animating us and living within us. And that Spirit is what gives us the power. That power is like dynamite. The power to overcome the death on a cross. So, I would encourage you to this. I'd like you to die today. I'd like you to die in a couple ways. I'd like you to die to fear. And say, you have no more threat or power over me. And if you want to flip it around, you can say, fear, you're dead to me. There's nothing you can do to me. I've already died in Christ, and I've been raised anew. I don't have to walk in fear anymore. No matter what it is you're going through, fear is an, a choice that you have to make. And you can die to fear. I want you to be free from the fear and free from the power of death because the Spirit of God testifies that we, though we will die, we will what? We will rise again. So death doesn't hold us down because it didn't hold Jesus down. Fear is a motivating factor. But faith in Jesus, I think, motivates us more. Instead of operating from a position of fear and doubt, we operate from a position of we've been accepted and loved, and now we can just worship Jesus and follow Him. There's no debt, no obligation in your life anymore to fulfill the fleshly desires. You don't have to go that route. You have power over this, and that power doesn't come from within you, it comes from the Holy Spirit living within you. See the difference? So receive the Spirit. Just like we prayed uh, as we sang. Singing is a form of prayer. We sang that song, Re Receive My Worship. Right? We have to receive. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God. And it's up to us to receive that gift in our own lives. Amen? Amen. Well, let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for living within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, God, that we would be free as you have made us free, that we would find uh, forgiveness to, to take a, a deep work and, into our hearts, that we would know that, that we are not uh, bound or limited by the, the sins of our past. Lord, I pray that you would develop, uh, that you would deliver us from any stronghold that's in our life right now, whether it be fear or some other form of, uh, of flesh, fleshly desire, something that's separating us, something that's keeping us from being close to you, Lord. I pray for deliverance in our lives right now. And for those of us who 
are desiring, and I hope it's all of us, Lord, before all of us who desire to be closer to you, Lord, I pray that we would simply open up our hearts and our minds and our spirit to you and say, Lord Jesus, we receive your Holy Spirit. We want more of you, Jesus. We receive your spirit. Transform us. Holy Spirit, you are with us and you are for us. Thank you for the life of power that you've promised us on the day of Pentecost. In Jesus' name, amen.